thank you everybody who's uh, making it out tonight. Hopefully uh, you had a good day and you got some of the rain, but not any bad weather. We definitely had some interesting lightning come through. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here uh, on behalf of MFGA, and the sitting president. Um, it is a interesting uh, year for sure for all of us. And um, you know, this is a year of many firsts. Um, we personally on our farm are doing a drive-through only market. Um, and I know a lot of other other folks are doing similar similar ideas and new new adjustments to uh, COVID, um, you know, response. So, um, you know, I think I think uh, on the whole, um, I, I'll also say that myself and Al Rose um, from Red Apple, both uh, some people might have seen, we we were awarded the uh, the recent uh, grants uh, just announced yesterday from um, the Baker administration. And I would encourage anybody who hasn't yet. To apply, um, there are infrastructure 100% uh, match, um, and it's a close of June 30th, and it's really just a wonderful thing that uh, we should really take advantage of. Um, and it seems like, the, from what I've talked to people, is that the you know there has been overall people are uh, are happy to get to farms, get outside, um, and uh, you know I think it's it's good for the for the industry, um, and I know that the. Commissioner LeBeau and uh, you know his team have been really supportive, and and uh, other folks on this call have been on, on meetings with with myself and uh, Brad Mitchell and others, um, and uh, we're really really happy and, and hoping that you know things continue on the uh, upward trend. And I mean, as we know, nothing's going to be drastic until we get a vaccine, which could take some time. And uh, you know, we just got to keep keep working at it and um, hoping that. You know, we all stay healthy, and uh, and I wish you all a success, su successful year for your uh, crops, and and hopefully uh, everybody in your family stays healthy. So just to run through briefly, so Tom will go run through a few programs that are available. Liz is going to be doing a disease update. Dwayne will be doing a harvest management update. Jaime will be doing an update on uh, SWD and maggot fly. And then uh, we have our guest, uh, uh, Tracy Lesky, uh, Dr. Lesky, as many of you know, worked years ago uh, with Ron at UMass. And, and we've really been thankful that, that she has gone on to such great things and really helping the industry as a whole. And we've been happy. At, I, I know my father, Tom, and myself have been happy to, to work with, with uh, Tracy through the years um, on her research. And uh, we're really fortunate to have her tonight. So I thank her for that. And then there'll be a Q&A and a, and a journey. So Jaime was kind enough to print out these IPM infographics. And for those of you who haven't already uh, put your address in during the registration process, if you want to let us know, um, we can send you a couple of those, two of those printouts. And also don't forget, we've been putting up videos on our YouTube channel to take you on our virtual summer tour of the orchard. We get to take you to places where normally we wouldn't be able to show you when we're there in person. And the last thing, of course, is that normally at meetings like this, we have our little coffee can that we're able to pass around. Can't do that now. But if you go to our fruit program website and you see this, this, this little button here that you can click on, that make a gift button from our page, will take you to a donation page that will automatically populate the um, field to have that donation go to us. So if you appreciate what we're doing or you feel like you can help us out, by all means, please do so. I'd just like to start off by thanking Ben and, and Wes and John also for providing me a few minutes on today's agenda. I want to talk about the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program and the Paycheck Protection Program. Both these programs have been around uh, for a little while now, but there's been a couple of changes and I want to make sure that everyone was aware of them. So on CFAP, that's a program administered by the USDA Farm Service Agency. Sign up began back on May 26 and apples fell under the specialty crop category. And specialty crop, crops had three separate payment categories. The first was crops that had a 5% or greater price reduction which was determined nationally by the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service between January 15th and April 15th. Second category, payments for crops that left the farm by April 15th, but spoiled due to no market. And the third category was payment for crop shipments that did not leave the farm by April 15th and have not subsequently been sold. 
Now, apples originally were eligible in categories two and three, but were not eligible in category one. But ongoing uh, reviews have been conducted, and on July 10th, apples were determined to be eligible for category one. So as a result, uh, any apples that were sold between January 15th and April 15th, uh, producers are eligible for a five cent per pound or a two dollar and ten cent uh, per forty two pound box payment. Uh, sign up is in the FSA office that serves your operation. I'd call ahead since the latest information I have is that uh, while producers can visit the FSA office, they may need an appointment before going in. Uh, sales evidence is not required at sign up. Producers will self-certify sales from January 15th through April 15th, but a percent will be spot checked. And if you're selected for spot check, the producer would then have to submit sales evidence at that time. Deadline for CFAP sign up, August 28th. Obviously this covers the 2019 crop. And from what I'm understanding, Congress is currently looking at options for the 2020 crop year. Uh, moving along to the Paycheck Protection Program, I understand that some growers have already applied and received Paycheck Protection benefits, but to those who haven't, there's still time to apply, and Paycheck Protection could benefit your operation substantially. Now, Paycheck Protection Programs administered by the U.S. Small Business Administration, those signups are done through lending institutions. Most local banks can accept applications. Farm Credit East uh, actually contracted with an outside online firm called Cabbage to process, process online applications for their borrowers. Paycheck Protection is a five-year loan at 1%, and the Paycheck Protection loans can be used for payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent and utilities. Now, a huge benefit is that the loan can be forgiven if the employer maintains employees and salary levels and at least 60% of the Paycheck Protection Loan is used on payroll. Now, originally 75% had to be used on payroll. And a side note here is that H-2A payroll costs are not covered since Paycheck Protection was developed to keep U.S. citizens on the payroll. A recent change also that occurred uh, earlier in the month was that eligible ex uh, expenses, which were originally covered for eight weeks after disbursement, now can go up to 24 weeks after disbursement. This applies to both existing and new PP uh, Paycheck Protection applicants. Uh, although, Existing recipients of the Paycheck Protection Program benefits cannot receive additional funding. The deadline for Paycheck Protection is August 8th. And, and this is the deadline though that the lender has to submit the Paycheck Protection application to SBA. So please don't wait until the last minute because there could be some back and forth with your lender that you're working with uh, to get this taken care of. Last I knew, there was over $100 billion still available under the Paycheck Protection Program. A lot of activity early on. It seemed everybody jumped on board. However, there, there is money available, and uh, certainly it, it's something I would encourage any fruit grower to take a look at, especially those that have um, fruit harvest coming up in the fall. Last thing I really wanted to talk about this evening was a potential new federal crop insurance program that we're exploring. Uh, the Risk Management Agency reached out to us recently to discuss a, a pilot program that will look at providing indemnity payments based on weather events rather than the actual production losses. This is something that we've been taking a look at for a few years. We finally got our RMA's attention. And as an example, uh, there's currently a program available for hay producers that covers drought conditions. And under this program, the way it works, producer purchases a selected coverage based on the rainfall data for, a gr for the grid where their farm is located. 
A grid is roughly 17 by 17 miles, and grids are established across the entire country. If the rainfall for the given uh, selected grid falls below the historical average for the grid, the producer receives a payment. Big benefit, no production records uh, have to be maintained. The potential pilot could be available in New England and would cover selected fruit and vegetable crops. We've also stressed the need though, if we're looking at fruit and vegetables, to cover weather events beyond just drought, including such things as excess moisture, excessive freeze, frost, hurricanes, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna be proposing to RMA a survey uh, that be condu conducted to fruit and vegetable growers to gauge interest in this type of uh, policy. The survey would ask growers to list their weather concerns in order of priority. So if excess moisture was number one to you, frost and then drought, you list them in that order. The timing of weather events, such as when are growers worried about a frost during the growing season, and then also crops that they would like to see covered under this potential pilot. Not all weather concerns nor crops would likely be covered, but we're trying to get a sense as to the most critical weather events and crops that growers would be interested in. Again, both fruit and vegetables. If the survey uh, goes forward, we would like to send it to the fruit producers through the Mass Fruit Growers Association. Uh, we realize that traditional federal crop insurance policies have not always afforded the type of protection that our growers need. So we've always been on the lookout for new types of products and policies. So that's basically what I wanted to cover. And again, thank, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Oh, and one last thing. Uh, we've been having over the last several days, uh, you know, some severe weather passing through. Just want to remind everybody that if you have a crop insurance policy or you have NAP coverage on any crops through the Farm Service Agency, make sure you contact your crop insurance agent timely or your FSA office. And with that, I'm all set. And again, thanks um, for this opportunity. So I'm gonna start off with a disease update. Every year, I like to play this game with myself that I call what looks like fire blight, but isn't. So this time around, I've got Nectria cinnabarina, which by the way, is a great name. It's not something that really causes an issue in commercial orchards, but it does crop up every now and again. And the issue that it does cause is a little bit of panic because it looks very much like fire blight. But it is, does occur sporadically on about 90 plus hosts, of course, including apple. I've seen it predominantly on Rome apple, but of course it does occur in others as well. So it's a wound colonizing fungus. So you see here, we've got this sort of stubby um, cut from, probably from pruning from last year. That's a fair guess as to where this particular infection came from this year. But it can also get in with when the stem breaks in the apple, other bud scale scars and other small wounds as well. It's not a wood rot fungi like some of the other opportunistic fungi that we deal with. It, it just, what it does is it, it kills the shoot where near the infection site as it's pulling out the nutrients. Um, and then that's the thing that girdling is what causes the shoot death to move, move on. This weakened tissue of course is susceptible to other more familiar wood rot fungi like our white rot, black rot, and what all. And then eventually this, will, this particular infection will produce spore and cause further infection. So it's easy to get this confused with a uh, fire blight, especially at first glance. So we, here we have these the kind of shepherd's crook looks like it's starting to form there. We have the dead leaves, which of course is indicative of fire blight. And we even have on the twigs, this blackening of the stem, which is something that we often see with fire blight as well. However, when we take a closer look, my uh, slides are getting ahead of me here somehow, we can still see the blackened tissues here. But what happens is we've got this, um, so the margins are really obvious, whereas with fire blight, it's more diffuse and it's harder to see where that margin ends, which of course makes it difficult to cut the fire blight out below the visible symptoms. 
Uh, one of the other things that we get are these um, kind of like pustules. These are the breeding bodies and they turn pink. And we're just gonna go on with this video because this is what fire blight looks like and how we can differentiate it from Nectria. Known before as a fire blight hazard. It can strike from that position of the ultimate vapor. And the really interesting thing is as you go down the trunk, if you see where we have the foam coming in down below, you can also see fire blight on the inner side. So that fire blight is just shooting through these trees. Here, same thing. Just a load of the blossom strikes and it is going down into the inner stem, which is too bad because there's a bunch of fruit on here. So, what we saw, first of all, we've got this super characteristic shepherd's crook that is far more um, far more obvious than what we see with Nectria. We also have the blackening of these leaf, this leaf tissue here, which we don't actually see with the nectria, it just, the tissue just dies. And of course we see the blackened stems and the ooze that comes out from there, that's the bacteria itself. So at this point, the thing that we can do is cut out strikes on small trees. And on the larger trees, there's sort of always been this debate about whether or not you should cut or not cut these, these strikes out. In larger trees, especially this time of year when terminal growth is slowing or stopping, it's less imperative to cut them out because what happens is the tree itself, first of all, older wood can stop the bacteria from moving into the trunk, whereas younger trees can't do that. Additionally, um, by cutting the pruning, pruning out this time of year, you can encourage new shoot growth which can then spread the disease further. So you don't really wanna do that. So some people would say that with a larger tree, if you've got just a handful of strikes, you wouldn't necessarily prune it out. Whereas your younger trees, you really need to get it out of there in order to stop the fire blight from spreading into the trunk and just basically killing the trees, which is what you saw happen with that video that I just showed. The Medal Dior had the fire blight come in through a blossom infection, got into the shoot and then straight into the trunk and down even into the interstem that it was grafted onto, which of course means that that tree is now hosed. So unfortunately, I didn't find them soon enough to get it out of there. Um, the other thing that you can do this time of year, manage your piercing sucking insects. So leaf hoppers, I don't know if it's everywhere or if it's just because where I am at is a new space to me this year, but I am seeing so many different types of leaf hoppers that I've never seen before. And these of course stick their, um, piercing sucking mouth parts into the tender shoots to feed. And if they happen to have touched other fire blight, then they're gonna just push it right into the tree and you're gonna have further issues. And of course, if you have a hail event, think about using a management material for that. All right, so moving on from fire blight to bitter rot because bitter rot is something that is really happening right now and and I mean right now, right now, because it is a swampy, swampy day today. It has been hot, it has been wet, and it has been humid. And those are all things that bitter rot need to cause infection. So like I said, 80 to 90 degrees is where it's kind of optimum, which we were experiencing today. Um, and then, but it is, it's kind of new to us in New England. I do recall two years ago, we had an exceptionally nasty uh, case of it. Uh, kind of across the state. And so it was a little bit of a surprise, at least to me and I think some other people as well, um, because like I said, it's relatively new to us here in New England's Southern disease. Um, but the infections can begin each year as soon as the conditions are right, which currently they are. Early on, infections look like this here on the screen. They are um, sunken and light brown to dark brown. As the infections progress, you get these concentric circles, and those circles eventually will have salmon-colored spore on them. You can't quite see it yet here in terms of the color, but you can see those circles for sure. Now, the other thing is when you cut into that infection, you see this conical shape of rot here that sort of points down into the core of the apple. That's one of the ways that you can differentiate bitter rot from black rot, for example. 
sanitation, of course, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, but in the winter, when you're doing your dormant pruning, pruning, you want to prune out anything that has been damaged because the fungus can overwinter there. It, Likewise, mummies should be taken out because they're a source of inoculum for not just bitter rot, but black and white rot and other things that you also don't want in the orchard. Now in season, you know, with all of this extra time we suddenly have, you can remove rotten fruit from the trees as well. Um, it's highly recommended to do that. Of course, we recognize that this time of year, that can be challenging. So one of the things I wanted to mention, because we are actually still technically experiencing moderate drought conditions in spite of the torrential rains that we have just recently experienced. Um, the earlier part of the, this drought condition that we experienced sort of has forestalled some of our more um, fastidious fungicide use uh, because it's enabled us to not have to worry quite so much about these infections occurring. Now, however, now that the rains have started to come again, we really do have to um, pin down uh, and stay covered up. So taking a page out of uh, the Sarah Villani playbook, because she's a smart lady, knows what she's doing, um, she was finding down her way in North Carolina, uh, by the way, we could probably send bitter rot back to her since it belongs down there. Um, Captian plus a phosphoric acid, uh, phosphite, for example, is an effective tool in North Carolina to control bitter rot, is what she's seeing there. Um, again, the, uh, the strobies, they work really well. Um, so flint extra, Luna Sensation, Maravon Pristine. With these, you want to add Captian to because it's a it's a broad spectrum, right? So you're going to be forestalling resistance development, which happens with bitter rot. Um, so EBDCs, the Manzate, it's effective. We are bumping up against the end of the line there. So basically, I put it out to about October eighth. If you're going to harvest then or after, you could potentially use that. There's an issue potentially of having applied your maximum amount of that and earlier harvesting varieties you can't use it on. When the weather, should the weather get dry again, you can stretch your applications out, but right now you should be keeping things really tight. And that's all I have. So good afternoon and today I will be presenting an update and the focus is on a spotted wind drosophila and apple maggot fly. Before I start, I would like you to uh, I would like to introduce my students uh, to growers, to people uh, attending this um, webinar. So, on the right, you will see uh, Dorna. Uh, she's a PhD student working on apple maggot fly, and her project is on the uh, optimization of the attract and kill strategies for uh, controlling this pest. Some good news: uh, a few days ago, she was a uh, um, told that she was awarded a CER, Graduate Student Grant, which is going to support research on nematodes uh, working with an uh, apple maggot fly. On the left, you see Pravina Regni. She is working on early season pests, basically chemical ecology, trapping, lures, behavior. And one of the questions is, can we develop a lure for tarnished plant bug and uh, European apple soft fly? We don't have the answer to this question yet, but we're trying. Then in the center, you will see a picture of Ajay Jiri. He is um, evaluating mating disruption systems, testing different lures to catch females. And the focus is on the three or four more important tortricid moths, godly moth, oblique banded leaf rollers, oriental fruit moth, and some work is uh, with the red banded leaf rollers. So let's now go to the spotted window sophila update. I will probably spend five to six minutes on this uh, insect, then I will move uh, to apple maggot for about 10 minutes. I have presented this slide before, and basically it's just to um, emphasize that there is, um, we have now commercial lures available for this pest. These lures in general are uh, effective, but they can be improved. They're a little expensive, some of them, um, so keep in mind that for any lure, for any bait that you use, high captures of this pest, it doesn't mean high potential for infestation. For example, if the fruit is not susceptible. But, and conversely, low captures doesn't mean that there is a, there is a low risk. 
if the fruit is susceptible. So it's basically giving you uh, more information about the, or mostly information about the presence and absence, but um, whenever the fruit is susceptible, um, changing color, for example, it's time to spray. So starting in 2018, I started investigating low cost uh, materials that could be used by growers in a, um, more, in a more easy way. You don't have to order them from, uh, from companies. So the hope was that they would be attract as attractive as the lures, um, which are uh, commercially available. So in 2019, we compared the early season uh, captures of spotted wind drosophila in just a couple of slides. So we had five locations and we compared three different treatments. And um, one was the diluted Concord grape juice, which was prepared by mixing one part of juice and three parts of water, the sentry lure, and we also included the alpha scent uh, lure. All traps were deployed in late April, and we inspected the traps twice a week because we didn't have we didn't want to have the fermentation effects on the grape juice. So this chart shows uh, spotted with drosophila captures combining males and females per treatment for each trapping date. So again, this is 2019. As you can see, early this season, uh, the first captures uh, took place on mid-May, and that took place on the uh, alpha grape and uh, the grape juice and uh, beta traps. Same in uh, late May, and then there is uh, some um, combination of uh, lures which are um, capturing flies. But then by mid-June, the grape juice is attracting the most uh, um, spotted with drosophila. And the Concord grape juice attracted mostly females. And then we conducted follow-up studies in the field, in the laboratory, and we found that this grape juice seems to be attracting mostly females. In contrast, the alpha scents and the sentry lure attracted uh, about 95% uh, males, 5% females. So now, this is the new information, is that we uh, decided to compare five different lures, um, well, including uh, the Concord grape juice, Four locations, we deploy the um, um, traps in late April. So each location has uh, five traps. You can see the sentry lure on number two is this clear um, bag that you see on the left. The alpha scent is the black pouch. And then there is two tresel lures, one which is more called broad spectrum and one that is more selective according to the company. So the first capture took place about a week later compared to last year. So we didn't have earlier um, um, captures um, this year. And there were three traps uh, that caught the first um, females, or the first flies, all of them were females. The Trece Broad Spectrum, number four, title number four, captured two females. Trece uh, Selective uh, Lure, three females. And the Grape Juice uh, captured, and uh, the traps captured two, two females. Then I decided to, come to uh, calculate the average number of flies for the whole um, early season, which is May 25th to July 8th. So about in, in, in about six weeks, what you can see in this figure is that the grape juice is competing pretty well against the um, commercial lures. And remember that the cost of the lure, of, of, the, of the grape juice, is about nine cents per trap compared to seven dollars, uh, five to seven dollars for the other lures. So it seems that it's working very well um, so we decided to stop that comparison so we don't have any more of the, all these traps in the, in the orchards. Now we're just keeping one grape juice baited trap in one of these um, um, four, four locations. You can see the seasonal and captures in traps baited with diluted grape juice. So the populations are increasing and that was as expected. So they want to continue increasing in, in the next weeks. So that's all what I want to say about um, spotted wind drosophila. Let's move now on to apple maggot. And again, this work is um, the research project of uh, Lorna, Lorna Sadat. So she has been very busy. I'll, I will show you why in part. Well, many of you already know that it is possible to control apple maggot using lures and other baited sticky spheres. Of course, sticky spheres are not very um, um, People don't like to use them. So around 2003, there was a new design, which is called the Atractisinal Spheres. This design was developed by Ron Prokopi, Starker Wright, and Tracy Lesky. So this new sphere design comprises um, a top, 
a cap, which has a sugar as a feeding stimulant, insecticide, which used to be delegate, and paraffin wax. And then you have the hollow plastic sphere plus the lure. And by the way, the cost, there is a new formulation now, the cost is about $38 for 25 lures. However, um, the insecticides are still a situation with this uh, sphere because delegate is not killing very fast. And we're trying to uh, integrate uh, other insecticides, but it's not that easy um, for um, even regulatory um, 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 situations. So this sphere is still under development. It has been about 17 years, and I think it's going to be a few more years before it's ready to go um, for growers that they can use it. So in the absence of this um, optimized uh, sphere, can we develop a, a system, an attract and kill system for apple maggot, where you can use lures and you can deploy them in the perimeter of the, of the orchard, the block, and then you spray the perimeter with insecticide mixed with sugar. So remember the sugar is, is a phagostimulant. stimulant. So we conducted this uh, preliminary work uh, last year in, in, with uh, Anna Wallingford and Glenn Kohler. In not, uh, last year we had uh, two treatments, attract and kill and the grower control. We had six orchards. Each orchard was divided into blocks. We, we were given two blocks to work. So three in Massachusetts, two in New Hampshire, and one in Maine. This is uh, what, what we did. Um, so you have lures deployed in the perimeter every 30 meters. And those lures were expected to attract apple maggot to the perimeter. Then we have um, eight spheres in the perimeter for monitoring. And we have also four spheres unbated in the interior. That's pretty much the standard way of uh, doing uh, this kind of work. Then, um, based on thresholds, growers spray insecticide mixed with sugar, um, three pounds per hundred gallons of water. And we also expected this sugar to help not only to uh, uh, stimulate flies to ingest more insecticide, but also to keep the flies more in the perimeter. And the grower control last year only had the forest fields in the interior, which are unbated. And then the grower will spray the whole block or uh, the approach that they want to, to follow for that control block. And every week we were counting apple maggot and, and flies. And then uh, at harvest, we also uh, conducted the sampling and determined the inf infestation levels. So this gra graph is from last year. You can see in blue captures that will be, that will be the average for all um, orchard blocks according to the tre treatment. So in blue, you have the perimeter row baited spheres. So every single week, as expected, they were catching more flies because of the lure. Um, captures in the interior, you can see in the attract and kill block, that will be orange lines. They were very, very low. That was no different from the control block. So the flies were, were kept in the perimeter and they were not really penetrating into the interior. Infestation data from last year, uh, there was some variability because we only had um, six uh, orchards. You can see that infestation in the perimeter, it was uh, around 0.8%. In the interior, it was around 0.2. So one, two apples in 1,000. In the control block, which is the brown or um, uh, bars, it was no difference uh, from the attract and kill blocks. So the infestation levels were very similar. So in 2020, uh, a few weeks ago, we wanted to get more orchards, so we were able to achieve that, and we have now 11 orchards, two blocks per orchard that gives the 22 blocks that we're working on um, this year. The approach is very similar, except that now we deploy the uh, spheres, unbated spheres in the perimeter of the grower control block. That way we can really compare um, perimeter versus perimeter for the two treatments. These are the results so far um, every week. That's what I will show in the next three slides. So the first week after deploying the spheres, it was um, the week of June, June 30th to July 6th. You can see about 2.5 apple maggot flies on average on those spheres which are in the perimeter in the attract and kill block. And this is about five times more the number that you can find in the, in the interior, which is our 0.5. The number in the global control are very low 
is about 0.5 in the perimeter because they're unbated and about 0.2 in the interior. So the good thing about this graph is that you are not finding more flies in the interior uh, or than uh, in the other block. So basically the attract and kill, um, the lures are, attract, are attracting and keeping the flies in the perimeter. So the next slide shows this, um, what happened last week. So you have, um, again, more flies, there is an increase in numbers, but on average, you have about close to four per trap on the perimeter, but it's still about 0.6 in the interior, in the attract and kill blocks. The roll control, very few flies. Then we go to this week, which is just, um, um, or oh, actually last week. Then you have pretty much the same situation, and the flies in the interior are increasing in one block. That's what is dri driving them or driving the, the average. So that block was sprayed. And at this moment, about five orchards, there was, there was a need to spray because the thresholds were reached. And the captures in the unbated um, spheres in the grower control blocks, they were very low. But um, in general, things to be working. So this is to be continuous. And I'm very happy that we can work uh, with more growers on Apple Maggot. And so we have all this list of growers who has been supporting the Apple Maggot research and the Spotted Wind Drosophila, and for example, Tim North. We have been collaborating with Tracy Lesky, Anna Wallenford, and, and Jeremy, Glenn Kohler, George Hamilton, and David Shapiro Ilan from USDA. And the funding is coming from three main sources. And you can see the New England Tree Fruit and Growers Research Committee, MDAR, and the USDA NIFA. So that's my update. And if you have any questions, thank you. I'm going to be talking about uh, plant hormones and uh, uh, harvest management. So next. Next slide, Lindsay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. That, that's good. Um, I've got three things listed here. What what uh, uh, growth regulators can do? Uh, Pre-harvest drop control, uh, which is primarily the, primarily the, the the use that they're they're uh, uh, use uh, employed for. Management maturity, especially uh, uh, trying to manage uh, harvest and sometimes spread out the the harvest so for pick your own so you have uh, popular varieties available throughout the pick your own and then uh, modify fruit quality and uh, I'm going to talk uh, right at the very end about taste and uh, uh, retain actually can improve red color I, I know it's noted for being for reducing red color but if uh, if you put a high enough rate and it uh, if fruit ripened later on in the season it actually can increase it next I'm going to be talking about three uh, three growth regulars: retain, harvista, and um, uh, napoline acetic acid. Not necessarily in that order, but next, uh, harvista. Uh, this works by irreversibly uh, binding to ethylene binding sites and and the fruit, thus preventing ethylene uh, from attaching. Now, as the fruit ripens, it creates these binding sites, and you have to have them to. To, uh, for ethylene to attach to before a fruit will ripen. And so um, Harvesta is almost identical in shape uh, and size to ethylene, and it will bind to, uh, to the, those uh, ethylene sites and uh, prevent ethylene from, from uh, attaching there. So as long as uh, it is there, they will, uh, it, will, uh, prevent, uh, it will prevent ethylene from working. Uh, back up, please. Just a second. Okay. Um, it's, it's, uh, Harvesta is, is, um, has variable acceptance by growers. My experience is uh, with uh, Macintosh is it's uh, it's variable also, and it's probably a better fit for uh, other varieties. 
the use of Harvista on uh, drop control compounds has been uh, with other draft control compounds has been not fully evaluated. And um, it's applied with a proprietary injection system, which is put on, uh, which is uh, attached to grower sprayers. And so, for information, uh, added information, you should uh, contact Agrifresh. Now, uh, one one thing about harvest is that the pre-harvest interval is is three days, and that oftentimes is useful. It gives growers a little bit more uh, flexibility. Next. The next one I'd like to talk about is uh, naphthalene acetic acid. This is the oldest growth regulator we have in use, and you heard me talk about it quite a bit during uh, during the uh, thinning season. There are many formulations available, so take your choice. Uh, one application of, of uh, NAA uh, retards drop for about seven days, and then a second application of 10 parts per million will uh, retard uh, drop for an additional five days. Uh, NAA can advance ripening and shorten storage life. This is influenced by the amount of NAA you put on, uh, the, uh, uh, the time from application to harvest, and also the temperature that occurs during that time. So there's a lot of variables there that can influence uh, how it influences storage life. Uh, it takes two to three days for NAA to become effective, so it, it occurs pretty fast. And after, um, <clears throat> Application should be uh, delayed until you see the first sound fruit drop because uh, it it's only useful for uh, as drop control and will last for a relatively short time. So uh, be diligent in picking out when you decide to put that on. Next. Some researchers report that when NAAs are combined with retain, there is an additional drop benefit. My work with Macintosh indicated that it did work part of the time, about 50% of the time, and 50% it did not. So I didn't think I could depend upon it, for, uh, uh, but uh, you should be aware of that. At least a half a pouch of retain is required to counteract any effect, ripening effects of NAA. And, um, NAA is a logical choice as a drop control agent to use in combination with ethafon to advance <clears throat> or ripening of fruit. And um, uh, this is something that's oftentimes done this time of year, so particularly for the early market. Uh, if fruit are going to be harvested within seven days, you can include NAA in with an ethafon application. But if you're going to delay harvest after that, you should put the NAA on perhaps three days later to get, give you that added drop control uh, because you're going to leave them on the, the fruit on the tree a little bit longer. Next. Uh, the mode of action retain, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about <clears throat> retain now. The mode of action retain is to inhibit biosynthesis and precursors of, um, of uh, ethylene biosynthesis. It takes time for, uh, for retain to become effective. And generally, it's 10 to 14 days after application to see much of an effect. It can be applied over a relatively wide window of opportunity. So pick your your uh, your uh, time that you want to uh, apply it. Uh, I would say certainly you want to pick a uh, a day that's not very windy because good coverage uh, is essential. Um, retain is not look translocated at all within the tree, so it has to the the spray has to hit the uh, the fruit that it is going to influence. Uh, retain, uh, if it contains a fact and, and uh, the, the spray dries before you receive a rain, you can expect to have the, the majority of the effect from the, the spray application. So uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, surfactants, uh, particularly the granosilicates, give it a certain amount of rain fastness. Next. Uh, generally, the rate used is a half a pouch or two pouches per acre. Sim single or mul mul multiple applications can be used, and uh, uh, but there is a two pouch limit per year. Generally, is applied two to four weeks prior to the anticipated harvest. And um, uh, as I mentioned, organosilicates are used here. It's, it really is necessary in order to get the uh, 
the maximum effect. And I'm listening Silhouette L77 and Silguard 309, which are listed on the label. Uh, the rates of surfactants are 6 to 12 ounces per 100 gallons, the lower rate you use when it's hot. Um, the label recommends it to be applied in 100 gallons per acre. Uh, there is a pre-harvest interval of, of uh, seven days, and that does prevent a certain amount of uh, uh, a certain limitation. Uh, the earlier retain is applied, the greater the reduction in red color, whereas applications uh, applied near <clears throat> uh, normal harvest will have less in effect. So oftentimes that will determine when, it, uh, when the retain is applied. Next. Retain does not do particularly well when, uh, when uh, trees are under stress because uh, these will be producing added ethylene. If the weather is hot uh, and persists for, uh, and as we're having right now, and you are treating non-irrigated blocks, it may be wise to apply or <coughs> retain just a little bit earlier and perhaps a little bit higher rate to get the, uh, to, than you normally would to get good drop control. Next. Okay, the retained use on Macintosh. Uh, this has been around for so long, and I'm sure all of you had uh, experience with it. Generally, initial application of one pouch is made uh, anywhere from uh, three to three and a half weeks prior to, to uh, the normal harvest. Drop control generally lasts 30, about 34, 35 days, but of course this depends upon the weather. Um, several lower rates may be used to reduce the negative effects of red color development and extend the drop period, and that's usually what, what uh, I recommend doing. Next. This slide shows the drop control that we get with one application or two application, one pouch or one or two pouches of, of retain per acre. The uh, uh, the middle, the upper uh, line is the drop on the controls, and uh, the uh, uh, middle line is the drop uh, on trees received one pouch, and the bottom line, the uh, uh, the drop from trees that receive two pouches. So uh, you can see that uh, two pouches is more effective and lasts a little bit longer. What, whatever you choose will depend upon your harvest and, and uh, what you plan to do with, the, with your fruit uh, that, you're, that, that you're treating. Next. Retain is effective at reducing drop, thus allowing timely harvest. However, it is difficult to delay uh, ripening on, on Macintosh as much as others uh, because it produces such a large amount of ethylene. So uh, we can be effective with drop control, but uh, extensive uh, reduction in, in uh, ripening may be a little bit more challenging. Next. Uh, I'd like to talk about retained use on Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp is probably the most popular and sought after variety uh, grown in New England. It has a pre harvest drop uh, problem and is a very low ethylene producer. Rates of retained use on, uh, uh, on honey, uh, rates of retained use on money, Honeycrisp uh, uh, often delay um, uh, red color development. And for that reason, generally we do not apply more than a half a pouch of, of uh, uh, retained per acre. This, this try, here we try to minimize the effect on red color development. Next. Frequently NAA is applied in conjunction with retained to provide <clears throat> early drop control. Unlike its effect on advancing ripening in many varieties, uh, NAA has little influence on advancing <coughs> ripening in, in Honeycrisp. Um, so the, the combination is oftentimes used. The lower rate, a lower rate uh, of retain may be used, and the, and the retain uh, and NAA may be applied with a uh, with a retain, and you can get the drop control. Of the uh, uh, of the uh, NAA uh, early until the the uh, drop control of retain kicks in and, and uh, oftentimes you can have uh, you know, don't have such a deleterious effect on red color development. Next, 
I'd like to talk about high rates of retain on, on Honeycrisp. An alternative approach that uh, I've used for several years is to apply one and a half to two pouches of retain about three weeks prior to normal harvest. This significantly delays ripening until the first or second week in October. I guess this would be no surprise to anyone. Um, next. Uh, this slide shows the uh, the, uh, the drop on uh, uncreated control, the uh, the uh, uh, dark circles on the top, and the uh, uh, fruit that was treated with with two pouches of retain. And uh, uh, what you see along the bottom is days after September 1st. And so even <clears throat> when the when the uh, uh, experiment was stopped, which is just the slightly after. Um, um, Columbus Day, you can see there's just slightly more than uh, a 10% drop on the Honeycrisp, and uh, of course there was a lot on the untreated. So it's very effective for a drop drop control. Next, the logical question that you ask is, what does this do to red color? Uh, this slide shows you red color development. Uh, the upper line shows the untreated control, the bottom line, uh, the uh, uh, red color development on on uh, the uh, uh, fruit that were treated with two, uh, two pouches of, of retain. And uh, uh, if you look at the bottom line, you can see the third harvest, uh, which is probably the early part, about first, second, third of October, and the and the second harvest is about uh, the 10th of October. You can see where, where uh, the red color development is, is greater than it was when we initially started and actually is about equal to that, the second, uh, uh, the, to the uh, uh, second harvest of the untreated. So uh, it will, uh, it, the treated fruit will develop red color. And this red color oftentimes is more intense. It's not like a pinkish red that oftentimes you get early in the season. So that's not something that, uh, that I'm particularly concerned about. They're, they're gorgeous looking fruit. Next. Um, other things that you should probably know about this, red color is similar to uh, 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 or better than normal at the normal harvest. Ripening is delayed, flesh firm is, is not reduced, and uh, an important thing to remember since harvesting late may exacerbate uh, soft scald, uh, fruit may be harvested, uh, may be, uh, may be um, uh, kept until Thanksgiving, uh, without any uh, problem with soft skull. Uh, of course, this will vary from year to year a little bit, but uh, uh, it, uh, it's uh, uh, you don't you don't have to have a fire sale right after because they were stayed on the tree so long. They are good fruit and they they last quite a while. Uh, and retain is a, a useful choice prior to normal harvest for. Uh, when you harvest retain at the normal time. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, half a pouch per acre probably is uh, is the, the appropriate rate, although I, I know some have used even a third of a rate. Next. I'd like to finish uh, up here by talking about use of retain on Cortland. Now, uh, all of you uh, grow some type of Cortland, I'm sure, and, uh, and you're quite aware that uh, that Cortland does not have a drop problem. So, but uh, we found uh, in our research that two, pouch, uh, two pouches of retain applied at the normal Macintosh time in October resulted in increased red color. They, this is because the fruit remained on the tree uh, for, uh, and they ripened in more favorable weather. Uh, there's a substantial increase in flesh firmness. Was, we, we got up to three pounds. There was a significant improvement in taste and, and it, it was noticeable. Those are uh, absolutely uh, wonderful tasting fruit. And then improved storage, especially right after harvest, if these trees, are, uh, if these fruit are treated with with um, one MCP uh, one or more times, uh, the, uh, the the storage of these will be excellent. And um, what I would say, if you've not done this, it's really worth trying uh, some. So uh, next, and I think my last slide, yes, 
Um, I think I've pointed out uh, three growth regulators that I think uh, in themselves can uh, be useful for uh, uh, influencing maturity, quality, and pre-arvest drop. And they all have their place, and, and uh, uh, one size does not fit all. Uh, and uh, I think if you uh, uh, if you uh, use uh, prudently use these tools, I think you'll be very happy, and I think it will be uh, profitable for you. So I think that's it. And um, I'm uh, uh, I don't know if there are any questions. I can't even see if they're uh, my screen. But anyway, uh, if there are any questions, I try to try to answer them. We did have one question. Thank you. First of all, Dwayne, thank you and Lindsay both for a great presentation. Uh, Sorry for the, for the technical difficulties. <laughs> it's the order of the day, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Andre is asking, would you store retained treated Honeycrisp until Thanksgiving over early picked Honeycrisp? No. I would... Uh, uh, because if if you ha if you have early picked, uh, assuming you uh, you're going to uh, you're going to keep them room temperature for uh, a week or so, and that will uh, that will help a great deal as far as uh, uh, keeping the soft gall down. Now, uh, when I uh, when I was doing this, I was very reluctant to harvest fruit on uh, on Columbus Day and then keeping them at room temperature for. Uh, for um, a week, and so uh, it, it could have been uh, that, that uh, we could have gotten a lot more storage out of them. But if uh, that is uh, that is really not the point, I think those are the ones you try to sell early because actually they are uh, 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 they will look better, I think, than the ones that you harvest earlier. They'll be more attractive. Great, thanks. And we have one more question um, from Donna. With so many varieties with Macintosh parentage, would you advocate for customized drop control? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the uh, the the, uh, the question, but uh, if you grow a variety, you you very quickly learn the uh, idiosyncrasies of that, and um, uh, I think that uh, uh, oftentimes the uh, the um, uh, parents of Macintosh do have drop problems, and so uh, you may very well that that would be a good place to start. But I think that you're going to have to let experience do your uh, uh, to uh, play a role here. For the last three years at UMass, I've worked with several researchers and extension experts, and one of those extension experts that I've had the pleasure of working with is Sonia Shulman. And if you've corresponded with Sonia Shulman lately, you may have noticed that she references more and more to riding off into the sunset. So tonight, the fruit team would like to kick off her farewell, starting with Dan, and then the rest of you can have a chance to throw in a few words as well. Dan? Thanks, Lindsay. I, I, uh... It's, it's sort of with mixed emotions. Um, Sonia and I go back longer than either of us want to remember um, <laughs> to the early days of IPM and their, thereabouts. And uh, when I remember when I was uh, looking, we decided we were gonna start a strawberry IPM program. And I was looking for somebody that would uh, really carry the ball. And uh, we had some great candidates and uh, you make a lot of poor decisions when over the course of a four-year career like mine and and but sometimes you get lucky and you make a good one and so i i hired sonia and uh from the point on that she took on that strawberry ipm program and really led the thing uh contributing to stuff that has uh stretched beyond new england um to in in managing uh pests and strawberries uh right on through she she picked up and led uh a great program uh she uh really is responsible for getting people interested in table grapes in massachusetts um 
and uh, in addition to that, working with the wine grape growers as well, uh, looking at all sorts of small fruit uh, innovations, uh, cold hardiness in brambles. How do we manage brambles in ways that will expand our ability to grow them in, in a in a more sustainable way? So I've just she's she's been a critical part of our program. Most recently, she has led our tree fruit team, and uh, it has done a great job with that. Has done a great job with everything she's tried here at U at UMass and. Uh, and we're gonna miss her, but uh, she's smarter than I am, and she's getting out at least a year earlier than I am, so congratulations, Sonia. We're gonna miss you, but good good call. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very, very much. I'm a little speechless at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would invite anybody else in our team to chime in, um, and, and anybody else in general. Well, what you see in the, in the screen is my personal statement or, um, to Sonia. I, I knew about her before I came to UMass, so it has been two years since I, we have been working together. It has really been wonderful working with Sonia. Sorry that you are uh, retiring, but I, I know you will be uh, enjoying your retirement. Thank you, Jaime. It's been a pleasure having you back at the university, and uh, I think we're very, very lucky to have you here. No, thank you, Sonia. So I myself, I remember the first day I ever worked with Sonia, it was St. Patrick's Day. And it was 10 years ago and the weather was gorgeous and we were out at Cold Spring Orchard and we sat out and we were able to eat our lunch outside. And I'm not sure why that sticks into my mind as much as it does, but it was just such a beautiful little moment in such a beautiful space. And I was very happy to be able to share it with Sonia. And since then I have been grateful to work with her um, both as an undergraduate, as a graduate student, and then um, as extension educators. And I have been so lucky to see the way she works with growers, her professionalism. And if it hadn't been for Sonia over the last few years, I don't know who would have herded this, heard this, this, this team of unruly cats as well and eff effectively as she has. So. Thank you, Sonia, for doing the hard work as well as just being a wonderful human all around. Well, thank you very much, Liz. That's very sweet. And I just wanted to say from Rhode Island, I've, I've treasured um, Sonia's friendship and uh, yeah, she's been a great friend and I've depended on her. I've called, you know, contacted her so many times over the decades, uh, getting, um, you know, getting information from Sonia, getting help from Sonia. Always so willing, so willing to help. And uh, I'm gonna miss you and I hope uh, hope to stay in touch with you, Sonia. I love you. Oh, thank you, Heather. Thank you so much. And I'm not going anywhere, so I'm sure I will see you and I'll see other folks um, in various places along the way. But thank Good. you very much. Sonia, I will miss your steady hand. You know, <laughs> I don't have one. Thank you, John. I hope you have a happy retirement. And yes, I'm sure we'll see you around occasionally, which will be fine. Definitely will see me around. I'll just chime back in and say thank you so much for having patience with me and for showing up and helping me do things like clean grape trunks and pull grape leaves when nobody else was there, um, besides the crew, of course. But thank you for all that you've taught me and taking the time to work with me before you ride off into the sunset. Thank you very much, Lindsay. It's been a pleasure uh, working with each and every one of you. I, um, I have lots of great memories and um, it's, uh, it's really been a, a great, great 30 plus years. So I, I appreciate all of the interactions with all of you um, and thank you all so very much. Sonia from New Hampshire, thank you for all the help you've given me over the years and all the growers here up here in New Hampshire. Uh, you're a great one and I'm gonna miss you, kiddo. <laughs> thank you, George. I'm, I'm gonna jealous you're you. getting out before I. <laughs> well, Sonia, since, Sonia, since Dan referred to the old days, I think you and I kind of came up together. Yes. Um, I particularly remember going out in the field with you one time when we were trying to do some kind of a crazy kludge thing of 
melting tangle trap to put on <laughs> traps for plant bug and soft <laughs> or for uh, for trying to plant bug and strawberries and oh. trying to heat it up with a little heater and you know just kind of the crazy stuff that we always end up doing in this business <laughs> but that's right um, but yeah I, I really appreciated everything that that you've done in in, in you know in, in small groups and you know with stuff all the time and thank job. you Kathleen thank you I, I appreciate that very much I'm going to take off <laughs>